Thank you. Uh, my second International Bioeducation Conference, uh, not really expecting to be the first talk after the plenary session. Well, uh, where are my slides here? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, today here I'm here to present uh, human pathogen interaction networks that have been uh, curated in the IMX consortium for, you know, a couple of decades, I guess. So for those of you who are not familiar with IMX consortium, we are a family of open uh, molecular interactions data providers. Uh, we came to an agreement that we will uh, work together uh, to curate only experimental, uh, 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 experimentally verified interaction data coming from publications. And we made an exemption to this rule during the pandemic. Uh, we curated the uh, preprints as well, but we made a promise that we'll go back and revise every publication once they are out and we still gave up the promise. And then uh, we share the same curation, uh, they follow the same curation rules, strategies, control vocabularies, and uh, 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 we do not, we try to reduce, we share the curation efforts, and so that we do, uh, we do not encourage any redundancy. We have an internal system that helps us to avoid any duplicate curation within our, uh, our model. And then um, every curated publication, I mean, everything that has been curated will be reviewed by a second uh, senior reviewer before it goes for release. Sometimes we fight against this, but that really helps. And then we uh, have this, uh, we make our data available in accessible formats, mostly in MITAB and XML formats. Okay, so I call what we, I mean, so these are the uh, members of our consortium. So we have Mint, Matrix DB, uh, Innate uh, DB, uh, Uniprot, Uni, uh, Intact, and uh, yeah, so many members working together on this. So what we call as the deep curation model is something that allows us to differentiate the interaction type, whether it is going to be a binary interaction or as an NRE association type or as any enzyme substrate uh, relationship. Uh, proximity, co-localization, et cetera. This is at the interaction type. And then you have the, we have a defined association, I mean, defined roles for, I mean, at the experimental level, at the biological level, ranging from weight, prey, enzyme, substrate, uh, donor acceptor, competitors, inhibitors, uh, stimulators, et cetera. And then you also capture if there is any mutation information available and that is going to have an impact on the interaction outcome, then definitely that we do capture. And also uh, the agonist and antagonist are something, uh, those do, do not really participate within the experiment, but they are available in your experimental data. They still have an influence of the interaction outcome. It can be anything like, uh, say, a condition like hypoxia, UV radiation, or any small molecule or, uh, or any protein uh, within the uh, experimental setup that has a notable influential uh, outcome on the interaction data. Well then, uh, based on this, we started building contextual, contextual interactomes, and the most famous is the, our coronavirus data set and also our mutations data set. And also we are working on something on the generating tissue-specific uh, interactions. This is work still in progress. It will be mostly available after the uh, next intact release. We are still working on that. Uh, so it's still uh, something that we are um, putting a lot of effort into it. Okay, so this is how our uh, curation starts. You pick up a paper which shows up an interaction data, then you show the experimental evidence where it is coming from, then we use our uh, control vocabularies uh, and OLS ontologies, and then feed uh, into a common editorial platform which is supported by Intact. And then within the editor tool, it goes to stages of curation, ready for checking, and then when the checker and the curator agree for uh, accuracy, then we set it for release. Okay, so likewise, we have captured um, interaction, I mean, uh, human pathogenic uh, interactions, molecular interactions data, so I have numbers for uh, the major, uh, uh, the, at least uh, number of species, mostly from the coronavirus, which we captured during the, we started uh, focusing from the pandemic, and this is from the coronaviridae family, we have captured, like, uh, there are more than 129 members of uh, uh, species, I mean, uh, coming from that, and we have captured according to the species. 
And then we have a lot of information coming from influenza and uh, rabies uh, and uh, papillomavirus, and you have bacterial information as well. So these are all, uh, mostly we have captured, focused on protein-protein interactions, but we still have information on the uh, mRNA, uh, microRNA interactions, which form the regulatory network, and then the small molecules are included, genes and nucleic acids, of course. So we have published an exclusive desert data set on the coronavirus, and uh, uh, of course, I think I updated the slide, but it is not, okay, that's fine. Okay, so this is the number of human targets that is, uh, uh, that is known, I mean, uh, for the pathogens that has been listed. So we have most numbers on the rabies, but coronavirus family still, uh, we have significant numbers and there are much less, yeah. Okay, so this is on our coronavirus data set. So as I mentioned, we started curating them from the pandemic and it still keeps growing. Uh, so right now we have more than 13,700 plus interactions, binary interactions captured from more than uh, close to 4,450 4, 4, publications. Uh, I updated the number, sorry. It's not the latest slide, I guess, but anyways. So we have close to 9,500 interactions with human proteins, and mutation data is available for more than 1,000 interactions. So the mutation information is, again, is classified, uh, with, uh, provided by the control vocabulary. So you have, uh, this, this is all derived from, compared to the wild-type uh, protein. So from the, compared to the wild-type protein, whether there is, I mean, the mutant protein, is having in, in what effect does it have on the interaction. So it can be classified as it could have the strength to disrupt the interaction or it could have the strength to cause a new interaction compared to the white type, which is, uh, we have such information. And there are, yeah, there could be comparatively with the respect to the wild type, there could be no mutation effort, I mean, no effect on the mutation on the interaction happening or could be decreasing or increasing like that. So all these are supported by control vocabularies. And then, uh, as I said, like since our curation model allows us to classify what is the type of interaction, we still have uh, close to 750 enzymatic interactions coming from it. And as I mentioned, there are uh, coverage of uh, close to 129 members of the coronaviridae family. Uh, our data is already constantly shared with the uh, COVID-19 portal, with, uh, um, and it's also available at IMAX Consortium browser and IMAX Consortium website, and it is in a virus mentha browser also. Okay, so from this, like when you ha capture all these data, like uh, we also thought it would be very useful to have them brought in a simple uh, filterable option so that it's easy for the users to able to have, uh, able to look into the depth of the knowledge, I mean, so they can make use of the curated data with multiple layers of curation, I mean, that has been carried out in, in IMAX. So Intact uh, provides the, uh, oh, sorry, the curation platform, and uh, we had a recent revamp on our website, which is, uh, which is able to support the advanced filter options that you can filter by species level, the interactor type, the interaction detection method, because many people, not all of them are happy with, uh, you know, looking at NRE, NRE interactions part of their analysis. So they like to go for the true binary interactions. So that can be, uh, so we have enabled that filter. And there's a filter for uh, confidence score, which I will describe later. So here is the simple network that I found for T53 human protein. So I found like it is able to, I mean, so it is a common target for many proteins. So uh, we'll come to that in the next slide. So in this slide, I'd like to want you to look at it. I don't know if this place didn't work. Okay. So in the um, so you will be able to see the, the edges, I mean the relation, the, the lines that you see between the proteins are, the interactions are uh, color coded and they differ in their width. That is because uh, it is a summary of many interaction evidences coming from different publications and different uh, uh, experimental evidences. So based on the number of evidences they have on a particular interaction, you have their thickness and color intensity varied. And so this is the summary view. And of course, the legend is very clear, I guess. Okay, so this is the 
Uh, I mean, this is the filter option that you get at the interaction species level. So I, here, what I have selected for human TP53, what are the possible uh, interactors? So we have simian virus, protein, protein, papilloma virus, rotavirus, and uh, uh, hepatitis C virus, and other family members. So uh, you can, you'll be, I mean, I thought this is also an opportunity to uh, get to the network visualization uh, tools that is available in intact. Okay, so the next is like once you filter for species, like uh, when you were looking at the uh, interaction network, uh, what I showed in the last slide is the summary view. But, uh, sorry, the previous slide is the summary of every piece of evidence. But now when you move into, when you look for the expanded view, you'll be able to see the individual piece of evidence coming from different interaction uh, methods, coming from different publications, so that is an option available. And then there's an option available for the uh, uh, mutant, uh, I mean, the interaction evidences that have a mutation information on part of it. So you have the, uh, uh, there are T53 mutations and also there are a few mutations in the viral proteins so, and those edges that have an impact on the uh, mutation in the interaction. Okay, so this I've selected one interaction. So, yeah, so this, is, this interaction has been selected and then, uh, and when we go to the interaction viewer, which when you click on the interaction selected, so it takes you to the next interaction page where you'll be able to see the mutations and also there are other, uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, binding domains that is mapped to um, uh, these proteins that, uh, I mean, they are backed by the ex experimental evidences. So you'll be able to see the mutations and the binding domains listed. So in the next slide, you'll be able to see uh, the uh, binding domains actually mapped to the amino acid uh, the sequences and also the mutation information, but whether how much they are able to influence the interaction outcome. This is all based on the experimental evidence. This is being mapped. And so we take a serious effort to uh, see that the binding domain information and also the mutation domain information are up to date with uniprot sequences. So with every uniprot release, we do run a pipeline. And also being, uh, there's a 20% human intervention to see them, they are mapped accurately. Okay, so then the binary and energy interactions filter options. So having said that uh, uh, you, when, and if you are not familiar with what you call as NRE interaction. So uh, there are many interaction detection methods and if I say I give an example of uh, uh, tandem affinity purification where you have one bait interacting with hundreds of preys possibly. And when you put it in that database, you need to expand them into one-on-one -on -one binary interactions. And we have the spoke expansion model which is currently being used. So sometimes if it is for the analysis, people are not really happy with uh, having the spoke expanded model because you really don't know which protein actually interacts with this and this is not available from the experimental evidence captured from the publication. So people would like to filter out and so that you have a filter at the uh, expansion model. So in this interaction, you'll be able to see like you have less number of NRE interactions in this case, many are true binaries and we are good. Okay, so likewise, have calculated how many number of true binary interactions do we have for each um, uh, pathogenic, uh, I mean, each species. I mean, uh, so for coronavirus, I think we have close to uh, 2,000, and we have most for Estenia pestis, which is most of the information are captured from true, I mean, East to hybrid array, so we are good with that. Okay, and so, and also, I want to touch upon the MI score filter, because as I mentioned, uh, you have uh, multiple interaction evidences. And so this is, these are all here to give us confidence on the interaction that we are looking at. So uh, basically our approach is that any experimental evidence, I mean, any experiment that detects interaction, 
could be artifactual, partly because of the type of experimental sample and the type of treatment that has been uh, uh, done to these cells and then how the proteins are subjected into different pressures. So we assume that every interaction could be artifactual. And so the accumulation of multiple evidences improve the score of improve the confidence of an interaction that's being happening. So then uh, uh, there's a filter option available. I just want you to take to the filter. So here is a filter that I have filtered the same network for a, a known threshold of say 0.5, which means that uh, the, uh, the score is given from zero to one. And so when, when you say um, you can set a threshold at 0.5, which means that there are at least two trustable evidences available for this binary interaction to be happening within the cell. So I, I have filtered this and still you have TP53 uh, having a lot of evidences for other viral uh, proteins. Okay, so how this MI score is calculated? So, uh, 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 so the MI, so we call this a molecular interaction score, and uh, it is a scoring mechanism to uh, calculate. I mean, it it calculates, it assigns a score based on three factors. One is what is the interaction type. If it is an association, you'll have a less score. If it is a, a direct interaction, means like. If the interaction is detected in a purified environmental condition and you know what is protein A and protein B put in the system for deduction, so then it goes score higher. And then a physical interaction evidence like, you know, in a living system, but it is a physical evidence, you know, protein A is binding to protein B, then it has a, a significant score, but still lesser than the direct interaction. And proximity and co-localizations don't they are not actually interactions, they are there. So uh, they, they score less. So if we have, and based on the number of interaction uh, detection methods, of course, and so the multiple publications, multiple uh, publications showing the same interactions by different interaction model. So we have a score assigned to it, and people who are interested can go into the loop I mean, look into the link provided, so it is available in intact. So based on this is where you have the molecular interaction score. And so I think, by the way, I just have three minutes. Okay, so this is how we curate, and I have just uh, portrayed uh, the uh, in the context of uh, human pathogen interactions, how the interactions has been captured, and how we assign a scoring mechanism. So the, all the data is made available from Intact Browser and also at the uh, IMEX uh, consortium website. So the contextual interactomes are available uh, in, I mean, all the data is available uh, for free usage and it is, uh, uh, what did I mention? Yeah, so the tabular formats, you, uh, the data is available in MyTab and XML formats for uh, use. So when you go to the network, of course, you will be still able to find in, we are uh, able to provide data in MIJSON and other formats for smaller networks, but not for more uh, large number of interaction data, which is still a uh, work in progress. Okay, so I think, yeah, we still have time. Yeah, these are the other ways to access our data. I think I with this, I conclude my session, and I'll be thanking all of our consortium curators and developers so far who have worked significantly, especially for Mint, who have contributed a lot to the human pathogen interactions context. Yes, happy to take any questions right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ten Faisi, Imperial College. Um, very nice talk. Thank Do you include the interacting components, macromolecules, in your system? Macromolecules? The you macromolecules mean? that are interacting. I mean, so here we are talking about proteins and proteins, so that or the molecules that have been, I mean, I'm sure the example for protein and protein, but in the network, you'll be, uh, you'll be finding other molecular types like mRNA, uh, non-coding RNAs, and et cetera, small molecules, et cetera. And but I, 
I understand in your context you are looking for glycogen, uh, glycan interactions. Yes. Well, uh, I'll say like we are, that is numbers very less as of now. And our partner, Matrix DB, uh, I don't think uh, she is here, but uh, they have captured a lot of them not available at IMAX level. So, but we still have ideas to work into that domain because I think that's a significant field we are missing in IMAX for quite some time. It, uh, we applied for a grant funding, it was not successful, <laughs> but once we have yeah, the results. I'm thinking of glycosamine, glycan, and other types of glycan sequences. Yes, yes, so that's something interesting, yes. I'll have a quick one then. Yeah, sure, please. Um, a lot of uh, uh, methods are reporting contaminants. Is there a possibility of having a list of contaminants, like there's a database called the Crapome, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, that so lists that contaminants in, in TAP, uh, in tandem affinity mass spectrometry, for instance, you collect yes, so, these. Uh, so Is, would it be possible to filter these uh, out? Uh, the, the contaminants of the while curating, I mean, so if you have the mass spec data for a list of proteins, and when you have, okay, during the mass spec data, when you have a list of proteins, and Curators, by knowledge, they know trypsin shouldn't be there, kind of, these are known contaminants. So we avoid putting them uh, in the curation model. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so in the interest of time, yes. we have to close here. Thank you very much. So